Hey everybody, happy Thursday evening Torch tutorial stream. Hope everyone is doing well today. Unfortunately, I am sad to report that the vacuum fairy is not currently available for an international tour, but she thanks you all for the recognition. <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to Torch Thursday. We're going to do a ring today. Hopefully it's going to work out better than the ring I tried last week on the Torch stream and then had to redo on the Freeform stream, which did turn out well the second time around. All right, today we've got our gallery wire ring. So what exactly is gallery wire? So gallery wire is this stuff and it comes in all different patterns. This is the one you see, I mean, I call this the most common. This is the one that I see most often um, and I think it's called the crown pattern, which is not surprising in any way, shape, or form. Um, but there are all different kinds of gallery wire out there. There are different patterns. And then there's, um, there's one cool dude on Etsy who makes gallery wire that's got like flames and, and like skulls and cool stuff. So there's all How kinds of fun things. Um, well, I would imagine one initially would do that with the saw, um, but at the level that he's producing it now, there's probably some kind of manufacturing process involved. But um, so basically the, the gist here is you've got a wire that's got a solid band on it and then it's got um, kind of a more open, flexible piece on the top. And this is actually how we're going to be setting our stone, um, is these little guys are going to fold over just like many, 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 many little prongs. So benefits of gallery wire, it's a little bit easier than a bezel setting because you're not taking a solid wall of wire that is straight and trying to convince it that it wants to be curved. This is much easier, I mean you are, but this is much easier to curve because it's very open, it's very much more flexible. Um, it's a little bit easier for weird shapes and for things with corners. Like I'm actually going to be setting a rectangle tonight. Um, you don't have to deal so much with, with the folding and such at the corners um, with the gallery wire. Um, and it's pretty. Now if you don't like this kind of you know filigree look then this obviously is not the product for you but if you like the look it's a lot easier to use um, as far as setting goes than just your basic bezel wire and it gives you a little bit of a more decorative look um, the one thing you really have to be careful of with with gallery wire is all of these super delicate little pointy bits they like to melt um, and unfortunately with the butane torches um, embedding things in heat sinks um, to keep the ends from melting doesn't work as well as um, you might want it to because you tend to heat sink away your ability to actually solder the thing. So um, we're just going to have to be careful and cross my fingers that I don't melt anything on stream. So let's talk tools and supplies. Okay, so of course you do need gallery wire. No, you do not need this much gallery wire. I accidentally double ordered gallery wire about two years ago and um, have been using the same supply ever since. <laughs> Thankfully at least silver was cheaper two years ago, I think. Uh, so gallery wire in whatever pattern you like. Um, it does all come in different heights. So you want something that is, it has to be of course at least um, a little bit taller than your stone so that the little prongies can, um, the little prongies can fold over on top of your stone, but you don't want it to be too much taller than your stone. So you want it to be roughly a millimeter taller than your stone, somewhere in that general vicinity. You're going to need a piece of sterling silver sheet, 24 gauge. Um, if your stone is bigger, you may want to switch to 26 gauge because at some point we're going to get to the point where this is going to be too much silver for our torch. It's not going to want to solder it. Um, I think I'm okay. I think I'm safe with this small piece of silver, but just be aware if you're using a butane torch that that's always something that could happen. Um, something else that you could do if you find that that's the case that you're not gonna um, or that you're having trouble zipping down your gallery wire because you've got too much metal here, you can take your saw and you can cut a hole out of the middle. You just need to make sure, of course, that your um, stone has a lip upon which to rest. So I've got my piece of sterling silver sheet and then I've got my band wire. So my uh, prototype, I did a uh, pattern wire for the band because I had some lying around, so why not? It goes nicely with the, um, it goes nicely with the gallery wire and I used a fairly simple stone for my prototype. I used just a glass cabochon that I had. The labradorite that I'm using today is a little bit busier, so I think I want to put more of the focus on my stone and the ring I'm making tonight. So I'm just going to use some 10 gauge half round wire. And I just need enough of that to uh, make my ring band. So this piece I have in front of me is going to be more than sufficient. 
And then as far as solder goes, I'm gonna need all three. That means I'm gonna need my easy solder, I'm gonna need medium solder, and I'm gonna need extra easy solder. And I'm also gonna need a tweezers. So I might as well use that to grab my pieces of solder out of this little box. Okay, so that's supplies. Let's talk tools, because of course it's a fabrication class, so there's a lot of them. Um, we're probably familiar with most of them at this point. So you are going to, of course, need a torch, right? If you're soldering with sterling silver, 14 karat gold, brass bronze, or copper, you cannot use an iron. It's got to be a torch. Iron is not hot enough. You actually need um, the open flame. You need fire. This is my favorite blaze of butane torch, the one I always use to solder with. You are going to need flux. All right, we'll talk about what that is and what it does when it's time for us to use it. You're gonna need pickle and a pickle pot, which I have off camera. We're gonna talk about that, what it is and what it does when it's time to use it. You're gonna need a soldering surface. I've got my solderite board here. Um, random hand tools, you're gonna need a metal shears. Um, you are going to need a file, um, a nice flat file, good sharp one. Um, it's gonna make your job a little easier. You're gonna need some fine steel wool and 320 grit sandpaper. And then your regular hand tools, that's going to be a wire cutter, round nose pliers, which you may or may not use, and a chain, that's a wire cutter again. Yeah, this one, chain nose pliers. Sorry. One should actually look at the tools when one is holding them up. You're going to need a rawhide mallet and a ring mandrel and probably some other things that I have forgotten. As usual, I will let you know what I forgot when I remember that I forgot it. All right, we're going to start by making our gallery wire frame for our stone. So I'm going to take my stone, which once again, I have this pretty labrador right here. And like most of our setting mechanisms, we do want a tight fit with our gallery wire. So I'm just chopping some off of my spool there. And then I'm going to form that around my stone. And like I said, tight fit. So you really want to make sure you get it as tight to the stone as you can. And sometimes using tools is helpful. Because see how it's kind of wanting to bow outwards? So I want to make sure that I've got a good fit there. And I can even, on that corner that doesn't quite want to bend, I can get in there and help that a little bit with my pliers. Just a little. And it's a little big. And this is one of those instances where it pays to be particular, okay? So doing your prep work, and, and I totally case in pointed this last week when I screwed up my project on stream because I rushed through my prep work because I was trying to get done in the amount of time that I had allotted for the stream, okay? So don't shortchange your prep work, okay? You are not going to thank yourself for it later. Okay, so I've got it bent around three sides. I want to try not to meet it at this corner here because what's going to happen is I'm going to get a really sharp corner there and the rest of these corners, as you can see, are kind of, kind of rounded. So I'm not going to meet it at the corner. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it down a bit. So I'm just going to snip off a little piece of that and then bend that last corner over. All right, give it a nice squeeze. Like I said, make sure it's nice and tight. All right, so that's my setting. <laughs> I always love the memes where they're like, there should be a margarita truck that drives around blasting Mexican music, or there should be a whiskey truck that drives around blasting bagpipes. There is actually an uh, alcoholic ice cream truck, I believe, that comes what do they to... Blast? I don't know. Um, but apparently, actually, they, they do know to post on next door when they're, um, that's in Marion Bix's neighborhood. They, they, the truck knows, not the truck itself, but the, um, <laughs> Kent is it, <laughs> Kent retired and became an alcoholic, um, 
ice cream truck? I feel like that's a solid choice. But no, choice. the truck operators is the word that is escaping me that, I, that I'm trying to find. Um, know yeah. enough to post on next door when they're going to be in the neighborhood so that all of the adults can um, plan their evenings around it. Plan their evenings accordingly. Exactly. Excuse yeah. me while I do a little bit of, oh dear, that was no bueno. <sighs> Cosmetic nail repair. And also, nail glue on my shirt. Super <laughs> exciting. Sorry, I, I, I'm always going to laugh when I think about nails now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. Dang it, I like this shirt. <sighs> the joy of, you know, okay. it's not noticeable. life with crafters is you get glue and adhesives and random things on everything. Of course, now I can't find it. Well, there you go. So it's not that bad. Well, right, but eventually it's going to dry and then I'm just going to have this stiff spot on my shirt. Uh, anyway, <laughs> At least sorry. you know why you have a stiff spot Hashtag on your shirt. Hashtag crafty girl problems. Hashtag pro tip, don't drop CA glue on your clothing. Okay, so now that I'm done with that fun fiasco, um, I've marked my uh, gallery wire. Got a little mark right there, so that's where I'm going to cut that. And that then is where I'm going to solder this together. And if you're lucky, you're going to get a decent pattern match, which I kind of, which I pretty much did. There's a little bit of a gap in the pattern right there, but it's not terrible. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with something like this, that's a pattern wire. It's just inevitable that, you know, at some point you're probably going to have a place where your pattern doesn't match up. Um, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> oh, Susan, I feel like there was some kind of punishment waiting for you <laughs> at home. You should have just taken your ice cream and found <laughs> a safe away place. with the ice cream truck. Exactly. Yeah. Instead of joining the circus, you could join the ice cream truck. Uh, yes. Okay, so now what I'm doing is I'm just filing the edges of my setting so that they, um, for anybody who, who didn't see that comment um, when we were talking about ice cream trucks, Susan said she once uh, has fond memories of chasing the ice cream truck as a child, uh, but she did it once during dinner and she should not have come back home after that. <laughs> I can imagine there were probably some unhappy parental units. Mine would have been so confused. Why is she running? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And I do not remember ice cream trucks growing up. I think, I mean, I grew up in the, the whole, like, 1980s, like, Stranger Danger and all of that. So I don't know if there was a, maybe there was a downturn in ice cream trucks in that era. I'm not, or maybe I just lived in a neighborhood that didn't have ice cream trucks. Or possibly my parents did a good job of deluding me into thinking that ice cream trucks were a figment of my imagination. We had too few houses per street in my neighborhood to really have ice cream, have ice cream trucks. trucks. So I, I can remember twice when ice cream trucks came by and my dad was the one leading the charge. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my parents believed in spanking as well. Thankfully for my hind end, I was not a stubborn child and I was very prone to suggestion. So basically, I think after two or three spankings, I was pretty much done with getting caught misbehaving. Though that last spanking, I still to this day maintain that it was not my fault. Nobody cared then, nobody cares now, but I am just saying it for the universe. Um, but my parents, they just did like um, with the, you know, hand. So there were no like paddles or switches or belts involved. My stepmother's grandparents did, um, they did, they switched them. And um, Denise has, of course, all of her memories of, they would do the, the torture of, uh, you know, making them go out and pick their own switch. Oh. And then if you picked a switch that they deemed non-sufficient, you would have to go up, go out and pick another switch and then... Um, you would get extra, oh, uh, goodness. You know, extra licks, of course, for picking the wrong kind of switch. I'm like, wow, there's so many neuroses forming there. Like, just so many. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a lot. Okay, yeah. so now I'm going to make my ring band. So I'm going to grab my ring mandrel. And um, there are two ways to do this. You can use that lovely contenti chart that I adore. 
which you actually can find. I forgot I made it a Mubok command. Oh, um, you did? Yep. I so, remember that now, too. Yeah. So you can use the, um, the link I just put up in the Twitch chat, um, and I will go ahead and copy pasta that. Mm, copy pasta. I know, right? Why did I have to say pasta? There. Yeah. Um, so I just posted that for um, the Facebook peeps as well. But you can cut your wire to the length indicated by that chart. Um, and then just um, la, 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 uh, put it around your ring mandrel to the right size. Or you can do it um, the slightly more freeform way that I'm going to do it tonight, which is I'm going to take my wire and I'm going to go about three sizes up. From the size ring I want to make. So I want to make a size 7, I'm going to go to a size 4. Move my blocks. I'm going to take my wire, and if you're using a half round wire, remember the flat side goes on the inside. So I'm going to hold that on my ring mandrel, and I'm just going to wrap it around, and I'm going to wrap it around until it overlaps. Now the reason for this is going to become apparent right now when I let go, it's going to spring up. Okay, so it's going to spring up to a bigger size than my size 4. Now I'm going to figure out where my mallet is. I'm going to take this end beat bit, this end bit that I couldn't, you know, get to curve down with my finger, and I'm just going to tap that with my mallet so I have a nice overlapped curve here, and then I'm just going to wiggle it down to the size that I want. Okay, I'm going to wiggle it down to my size 7. And I'm going to figure out what the actual heck I did with my marker. Hey, I put it away. That was dumb. And I'm going to mark straight across. So I, I know I flush. I just flush. Oh, all right. Dinner at Susan's. We'll be well, there in an hour. <laughs> Alice will be there in an hour. <laughs> Actually, not I bet you that's $20. Gonna... That's true. So, I mean, now you've absolutely totally busted me into the fact that I wasn't actually planning on just raiding Susan's house for dinner. So thanks, Heather. <sighs> Sorry. I mean, yeah, we're, we'll be there soon, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Heather's vegetarian. I'm gluten-free. I adore <laughs> carbonara. Um, and I always make mine with bacon as well because I usually have bacon in the house and I rarely have pancetta in the house. Um, same. But yes, love carbonara, but of course, gluten-free pasta. I also am very excited. I discovered a whole new line of frozen, already sauced, gluten-free pastas. So I um, ordered groceries today. So I have lemon thyme gluten-free fettuccine that oh. I'm very excited to try. That sounds awesome. It does sound awesome. Okay, so I'm marked. Um, hey, I said show my hands. Um, I marked across um, my sharpie there so I'm just going to take my cutters I'm going to make sure oh, I use the ray. booty it's a booty ray that's awesome <laughs> yay hi peoples that's well, we're everything. being raided by Alexa online um woohoo welcome raiders how are y'all doing awesome show me show me how show me the, show me the stuff stupid computer Woohoo! Awesome! Love, 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 love. <laughs> so Alexa is actually the leader of this raid, it looks like. So hi, Alexa. How are you? So I'm assuming that, that Booty Sweet Talk to you and coming on over here. What we're all doing on stream this evening, or whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. <laughs> this time? <laughs> what, what, what were you doing on stream just now? <laughs> There you go. <laughs> All right, thank you all so much and welcome. So for any of our newbies, hey, I'm Allison from Beating Dreams in Dallas, Texas. You have found the Beating Dreams stream. It's Torch Thursday. That means I'm about to bust out some fire to make this ring. This is our gallery wire ring. Um, so we're gonna do, holy wow. crap. What? Of course we're talking about food on the crafting stream. I mean, come on. Eight hour scrapbooking stream? That you're a beast. That's insane. I can barely make it through a one hour tutorial and a two and a half hour sale and I want to go home and collapse. Well that's because it's also at the end of your work day. Well, there is that, but still that's fantastic. That is amazing. 
Wow. Okay, so now we're gonna light some, well, not quite yet, but in a minute when we're done with our prep work, we're gonna, we're gonna light some fire, which is gonna be loads of fun. So I've got my ring and I'm gonna cut it. I'm gonna use the flush side of my cutters to cut that. And that's my ring band. Hopefully if I did this right, this is gonna be a size seven because I'm real sick of making rings that don't fit me. Even though theoretically they're all for sale, it's still nice when they fit me. Like this one, I finally so managed. So people can buy them off of me. <laughs> so people can buy them off of me. It's true. Also, I 100% CA glued um, paper towel to my finger. Oh, hey. Because I'm awesome like that. Um, yeah, so, Ooh. so far this stream, I've managed to, um, whilst gluing my fingernail back on, get CA glue on my shirt and also, um, apparently, glue a piece of paper towel to my finger. So, this is the kind of stream you've, um, raided into just so that no one is surprised. I'm not even allowed to use CA glue. <laughs> and yes, yay, Canadians! Okay, so now I have to do the same thing with my band that I did with my setting, which is I need to file it. And I'm sorry, I keep being out of focus because I have it set um, farther away than typical. Because um, I'm, I'm going to have it focused on my soldering surface. So I'm just going to file this once again with a good sharp file. It shouldn't take you very long to um, neaten up these edges. And our goal is we just want them to meet flush with no space in between. Oh yay! Multiple Canadians! Woohoo! So, um, so yeah, so one of my uh, besties uh, is also Canadian and I made her give me a little Canadian geography lesson the other night after a couple of cocktails um, as to, you know, like where she's from versus where Lori is and it was, um, it was quite amusing. And yes, I realize I absolutely could have, you know, Googled it, but it's so much more fun to it is much more ask fun. your friend to give you a geography lesson in charades after several cocktails. Okay, so I'm, I'm good with the... Um, I would pay for Mandy geography lesson. Oh, right? Yeah. Um, northeast of Maine. Okay, so yeah, you're on the other side from Lori. Cool. Yay! We've got Cross Canada coverage. Exciting. Yay! Okay, so I am, um, all right, so I'm good with the fact that my ends are meeting flush. I'm bad with the fact that they're not aligned. So I'm just going to take my chain nose pliers and just bring this one down a bit because however they're lined up right now is how they're going to get soldered. So we want them to solder obviously flat. Um, and at this point, if my ring's not round anymore, that's okay because um, I can fix that. Fix it later. All right, come on. Okay, I think we're ready to bust out the fire now. Yay. So, let's get all the flammable stuff sort of away from the camera because we do not want a replay of the great webcam melting incident of the late 2020. Yes, I did on, actually I guess it wasn't late 2020 because I, was I here? I was here. You were here. Oh yeah. It was later 2020. Yeah. So, so yeah, I yeah. absolutely 100% melted my webcam with reflected heat during a stream last year. So we're going to try and not do that again. Yeah, let's not and not even say we did. Yeah, let's not even say we did. Okay, so it was, yeah, so it was before Lori joined, joined in March, so it was late last year. All right, so now I'm going to, all right, make sure that we can actually see these. There we go, cool beams. All right, so I'm going to solder these two things first. So I'm going to solder this ring with medium solder and I'm gonna solder this one with easy solder. Um, that's just because those little points are so delicate that I don't wanna try with medium solder. I'm afraid I'm gonna melt it. So let's talk for about a couple of things. Um, and let's start with this chemical in this jar, flux with the skull and crossbones on it. So what flux is, is it is a chemical that protects your metal from oxidation, okay? So oxidation being um, a function of the heat. The first thing that's gonna happen if you hit a metal that is either base metal or has base metal components to it, with a torch, the first thing that's gonna happen is it's going to turn black. It's going to oxidize. Okay, that's a problem because um, solder will not flow on oxidized metal. And so we need to, can you get me just like a drip of water in that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
we need to protect the metal from the oxidation, otherwise our soldering's not going to work. So that's what the flux does, is it protects the metal, keeps that oxide layer from forming. Don't inhale it. No, I just almost ran my head through the beaded curtain. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so flux is a chemical that prevents that oxide layer from forming and therefore allows you to solder. And I use um, Handy Flux brand Paste Flux, um, which when properly hydrated looks like this. It, um, I like mine about the consistency of yogurt, um, so it's easy to paint onto my metal. But the cool thing about the Handy Flux is you can, you can hydrate and dehydrate it, so you can make it thinner by adding water or you can leave it open, let it dry out a little bit if you want it thicker. Um, and since I am gonna be soldering, I'm gonna be zipping this down later. I'm gonna flux the whole thing because I need this bottom surface to stay free of oxide as well. Because uh, I'm gonna need to solder it down to my uh, piece of sterling silver sheet, which I have here, which we're gonna use in a minute. So the other thing to talk about is let's talk about solder for just a second. So I use wire solder. Um, there are different delivery systems for wire, for solder. This is wire solder. Sheet wire and paste are the three ones you're going to see. And I'm a fan of wire solder. I just think it's easier to portion out. So that's what I use. But they make solder in different densities. So solder is um, essentially, it's called a filler metal. It's a metal that melts at a lower temperature than the metal with which you're actually fabricating. Okay, so my sterling silver melts at a certain temperature. My solder melts at a temperature lower than that. That's what makes that whole soldering process possible is that the solder melts before the metal. Now, since metal conducts heat, as we saw last week, it is 100% possible to completely screw up your project if your project has multiple joints by heating your project and then all of a sudden all the solder in all your previous joints lets go and all of a sudden everything falls apart, melts into bits on stream, there's crying, there's terror, there's just awfulness and, and sad puppies and sad kittens everywhere. That was last week on the Beating Dream stream. Maybe I'm being a little melodramatic, but there may have been sad bunnies too. It, it, it was pretty bad. I think there were definitely, there was definitely a sad Allison. I'll there was tell a you sad that for sure. But they make solder with different melting points, meaning there are different amounts of um, the metal that they put into the solder alloy to lower the melting temperature is zinc. So there are different amounts of zinc in the solder which allow it to melt at different temperatures. So the three um, densities of solder that I am using today are medium solder, easy solder, and extra easy solder. Hey, can you uh -huh. um, let this person know that I'm on stream? Yes. Thank you. Um, so always start with the highest density solder, all right? Always start with um, if you're using, you know, medium, easy, extra easy, you always start with the highest, which is in this case medium, then you step down, then you step down. Um, so I'm doing my band with medium. If this were, um, ow, I dropped a flagstone on my left pinky and it's, it's still not quite right. And I just did basically jazz hands with my poor, poor swollen pinky and that was not a good choice. Um, but anyway, uh... The only exception is I'm using easy on my um, on my gallery wire because once again I am afraid of melting it. So I'm gonna take my cutter and I'm going to cut my solder. Don't need very much, okay? It is astonishing continually to me and everyone else how little solder you actually need to close a joint. So that is about a one millimeter piece of solder. I'm just gonna snip that off. That was the medium, so that's gonna be for my band. And then I'm gonna do the same with the easy. And that's gonna be for my setting. I'm gonna take my tweezers and I'm just gonna place my solder on top of my joint. And if you have trouble balancing it, uh, just putting a little bit more flux on there so that it's um, damp will help that. And then I'm gonna go ahead and solder these. But before I do that, I'm going to quickly give you Allison's five point soldering safety lecture. Uh, before I light my torch. So first of all, I do need to start with the disclaimer, all right? I am not a certified credentialed anything with regards to safety. There's literally no reason you should listen to me about this stuff. I'm just some rando on the internet. But 
I am Miranda who's been teaching soldering for probably almost 10 years now and there are a number of points that come up consistently as far as number one making a safe workspace at home or wherever your own personal workspace is and number two being safe in a group workspace environment so number one do as I say not as I do keep six to eight inches of clear space around your torch at all times that means there should not be anything that is flammable or meltable within six to eight inches of your torch. Fun factoid, a lot of plastics after they melt, which is not just me, well, they, I melted the crap out of the lid of this flux jar one time. Um, a lot of plastics, see look, look, charring, melting, it's fantastic. A lot of plastics after they melt, then they set, then they combust. So, so nothing flammable, nothing meltable within six to eight inches of your soldering workspace. Number two, once you've had a flame going in your workspace from that point forward, always assume that everything in your workspace is hot enough to burn you, even if it doesn't look like it, because chances are pretty good it is, even if it's not red and glowing, it's probably still too hot to touch. Tweezers are your friend. Number three. Yay! Hi, Amy. Amy says she is very happy to see us and no one else. For the next hour, no animals, no people, no one. Trust me, I can sympathize with that. That's awesome. Melting plastic does also stink bad, which speaks to my third safety point, which is ventilation is important, okay? If you find that you are coughing, hacking, wheezing, or feeling otherwise uncomfortable in the lung area after you've been soldering, you may need to re-examine your ventilation situation, okay? You may need to go outside. You may need to go by a window. You may need to install some kind of ventilation you know, hood or fan, you know, everybody's different. I'm fine with just being in a relatively open room. That being said, I don't also don't do this, hi Jenny, for hours and hours at a time either. So there are lots of factors, you know, your own personal sensitivity, what chemicals you're using, how often you're soldering, etc. Um, let's see, number four, if you're not actively soldering with your torch, turn it off. These puppies are very easy to ignite. They're very easy to extinguish. There is no reason that you should leave your torch burning and walk away from it, okay? Because if your torch gets knocked off of your workspace while your work surface while it's still burning, then you have fire in places you don't want fire. Usually the only place you want fire is in your torch. So if you're not using it, turn it off. And then number five, make sure that you know where the fire extinguisher is. And if you are in your own personal workspace, you really ought to have a fire extinguisher within arm's reach. So those are five simple points that are definitely, you know, it's not the be all and end all of safety, but it's definitely some things that are important and um, will go a long way to helping you create a safe environment in your home. Of course, if you're making a home studio, definitely consult all of the actual experts and do everything you can to make your workspace as safe as possible. So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to solder these. All right, I'm going to have my solder pick in my hand just in case something goes wonky. I'm also going to zoom in on that a little bit for y'all so that hopefully you can get a better look of the, um, the solder flowing. <laughs> Ventilation is good to have. If you go outside, you will be dealing with all of the allergens in the Texas air. Jan cool. is not wrong there. No. And there are so many allergens right now. Oh, so many. And they're all in my nose right now, except for the fact that some of them are, I'm pretty sure, in Heather's nose. Yes. Yeah, but we're splitting them. We're splitting them. I don't know. You might have more of them than me. There, now you can see that a little bit better. Boogers? <laughs> I was going to say allergens, <laughs> but, you know, whatever. <laughs> okay. So now we're gonna heat these until the solder flows. So that goes like this. Light your torch, heat your metal. All right, so I need to heat the whole thing. So you can, you can see there my torch flame is going around my whole piece of metal. You need to heat the whole thing because metal conducts heat. So you can't get your solder to flow until you get your metal up to temperature. So once my metal is up to the temperature where solder can flow, and I can tell that because my flux is turned clear, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to concentrate my flame on the joint. Alright. And I want my solder to flow. I don't just want it to flow. I want it to come across the joint and close it up. There we go. So, solder flows towards heat. So what just happened was my solder flowed, but because of the angle that I had my torch at, 
it flowed only on the side of the joint. So what I did is I put my torch on the other side of the joint to kind of bring it across. And I don't actually know that I succeeded in that. So let's try this again. Now the cool thing about this is since you are going to solder this down to your back piece, if you can't get your band to solder together, it's not the end of the world. Alright, I'm going to grab myself. I don't know. Are you soldered? Well, there's one really good way to find out. So I'm going to set this aside and now I'm going to do my gallery wire. Same thing, heat the whole thing. And once it goes clear, focus on the joint. All right, and I think, can we solder? Okay, so we're gonna let both of these cool and then we're gonna test them, see how I did. God, that's insane. Okay, well, I don't even know what to say to that except for that. That's just absolutely nuts. Okay, so I'm going to put this ring on my ring mandrel and I'm going to round it back out. So this is where I'm going to find out if it actually soldered together or not. So I'm just going to take my mallet and I'm just going to tap that back into shape. And so don't be afraid to smack it on the solder joint because there's no way to know if it's soldered together unless you really test it. This is something that, and, and by the way, for anybody who is waiting with bated breath, it did in fact solder together and it does in fact fit me. So hooray on both counts. But I get this a lot with my students of people being really scared to test their things um, and Yep, okay, so that one didn't. So let's go ahead and re-solder that. Um, people just being really afraid to, to test their projects, which I get that you, you know, I get that you don't want your project to fail that you've just worked so hard on, but the thing is, if you don't test it well enough in this stage, then you're gonna have problems when you go to the next stages. So it's just better to just give it the wiggle and, you know, deal with the consequences. Okay, so um, this did not solder together. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pick transfer some solder on there. So pick transfer is usually my preferred method of soldering when I'm not on stream. So I'm going to just melt this piece of solder into a little ball. This is still my easy solder. And I'm going to scoop that up on my solder pick and then I'm just going to heat my metal and I'm going to drop that off and I'm pretty sure that time it did actually bond. Yes. I think we're good now. All right, so I'm going to let this cool for a second. Um, the best way to cool it is to get it off of your soldering board because the solder board is designed to absorb heat and reflect it back on your work, which means that um, it's absolutely terrible at helping things cool down because that's not its job. So getting your piece off of your soldering board is going to help it cool down faster. I'm going to form that around my stone. And that is still a little hot, by the way. I'm going to give that another second. Also, it's not good for it to touch your stone when it's hot. It's, it's like just barely too hot for me to touch. All right, I'm going to press that around my stone to get my shape. And this is where you figure out if I made it tight enough or if I made it too tight. And I think I made it just tight enough. The thing that is a bummer about the gallery wire is the pointy bits. They hurt when you press down on them. So you can definitely, um, this is a good time to just bust out a piece of leather or you know gloves if you have them so that when you're pressing this down, 
to see your stone in it. Did I just really pop? I just popped that nail again that I just glued. I'm not gluing it again. There was too much tragedy last time. <laughs> My heart can't take it. Okay, so this is pretty much a perfect fit here. Um, so this is ideally what you want. This is tricky and it's a little bit scary because there's absolutely no room for error here. So if I um, misshape this setting even a little bit when I'm zipping it down to the back plate, my stone's not gonna go in it. So, you know, no pressure or anything. So I'm gonna pop my stone out. And that's another thing that like, it's in there so tightly, which is awesome, but come on. You know you wanna come out of there. Maybe. Again, it's the stabby bits that are getting me. Come on, get out. Get out, get out, get out. You can't be in there yet. It is really stuck in there. Crap. What is it with me and soldering streams and things going wrong lately? I do not understand this. I do not like it. Um, I, but Mer I mean, we're in a hangover. We're not actually in retrograde anymore. All right, so I'm gonna do a bad thing and I'm just gonna tap this with my stone in it to just make it a little bit bigger. The reason you don't ever, ever wanna hammer on something with a stone in it is because you can crack your stone. But I just need a little bit more wiggle room. So what I'm doing is I'm just planishing my metal to get it just a little bit bigger so that hopefully this booger will come out of here. I and see it did actually work. So that's what was supposed to happen the first time. And luckily my stone survived unscathed. Thankfully Labradorite is a pretty sturdy stone. But once again, that is a course of last resort. Like don't ever, ever hammer on, on a stone because um, you hit it the wrong way and it's just going to crack on you. Um, you know, Lori would. Um, so Lori's asking when you're when you're bezel setting something um, that has a closed back. When you're fitting the stone in, you'll put a piece of dental floss down, and that will help you pop the stone out. Um, once you're done checking to see if it fits, um, and I don't know, it was in there so tightly. I have a feeling the dental floss probably would have just ripped. Who knows? Maybe next time I'll try it. Okay, now we gotta flatten out the back of this setting, so we're just gonna put it on our 320-bit sandpaper and just sand the back of it. Because once again, solder will not flow across a gap. So, we need to make sure that there are no gaps. All right, so I've sanded the back of my setting. I'm gonna just set it on my piece of sheet metal and hold it up and check for gaps. Check for air spaces. And it looks like I don't really have any, so let's try this thing. All right, now I'm going to zip my setting down to my back piece. So I'm gonna go ahead and flux everything. I wanna flux my back piece. I wanna make sure that the bottom of this is flux because silver is such a princessy metal to solder. Um, it's super, super sensitive to being dirty in that it doesn't, silver does not like being dirty. And so if you've got even a little bit of oxide that forms underneath there, you're going to have horrible times trying to zip your piece. Okay, so now I'm going to take my extra easy solder. I'm going to do four pieces. I'm going to do one at each compass point. That's actually probably more than I need. Um, but, better safe than sorry. People who are better at this than me can do something like this with one piece of solder, which just astonishes me whenever I see it done. That is some badassery right there. I'm a solid fabricator, definitely not to that level yet. All right. 
So you just want to carefully sort of shimmy them up so that they're touching that point where the setting and your back plate meet. And this is, again, my extra easy solder. And yes, I am going to use my extra easy solder as well to solder this onto my band, but once again, with the delicacy of the points on this gallery wire, you, you really don't want to try this zipping, or I don't want to try this zipping, with anything that has a higher melting point. Because bad things happen really quickly with gallery wire. Alright, so that is set up. Okay, so you can see my teeny solder pieces there. There's another one there, there, and there. So my goal is to heat these and get them to zip or flow underneath the setting and um, bond the whole thing together and see how it goes. So first I'm just gonna heat the whole thing. I wanna concentrate more on the bottom here. I don't wanna focus too much heat on the tops of those little points because I guarantee you they will melt before you can say, no, don't melt. Before you can get out a four letter word, those babies will be gone, gone, gone. All right, so everything's reached the temperature where solder can flow because all my flux is clear. So now I'm just gonna focus on the outside, see if I can get that solder to pull through and underneath. And of course, what wants to happen always is it wants to flow up the side because of course the gallery wire, the side of it, you know, the gallery wire gets hot faster. See, it wants to go up the side. So what you got to do is you got to gently pull it down and use your torch to lead it around. Also, you know, hashtag pro tip, don't point the flame towards your hand. All right, there we go. We've got some zippage now. Woohoo! So once you get a part of it to flow, usually just kind of leading it around with the flame is your best bet. And then if you've got places that don't have good contact, you can just gently press with your tweezers. And this whole corner really can come down more. And with the gallery wire, you gotta be careful where you press too, because you can't press on those little um, filigree bits while you're heating. They will, once again, melt before you can say, Jimmy Christmas. All right, I think I see zippage. Cool beans. All right, so I think I've got zippage all the way around. Yes, that's an actual metal smithing term. Ask any metal smith who doesn't have a giant stick up their butt. And they'll tell you. Now it's stuck to my solder board. Um, that's just the flux residue that does that because it's sticky. It's um, liquid when it's hot and solid when it's cold. So if you don't, if you've heated this as much as I have and you don't get it off the board right away, um, your flux will just solidify and stick your piece to your board. So if I had quench water, I could quench this. I can quench this in a pickle, actually. So once, um, if you need to quick cool, a piece that you've been soldering, you can just keep a cup of water by your work area and just dip it in there or drop it in there. It's called quenching. And um, as soon as you hear that kind of sizzling sound, which you may or may not have heard from my pickle pot off camera, um, your piece is yeah, cool enough to touch. Okay, so let's examine. All right, I think I did it. I think I zipped it. Okay, so now my piece is soldered down to my back. Now I'm going to grab my metal shears and I'm going to cut away this excess metal. And there's not a whole lot of excess metal. Um, I did that on purpose for two reasons. Number one, because um, I want to minimize my waste because silver ain't cheap anymore. And number two, um, I wanted to minimize the amount of metal in the project because once again, with this small torch, you run into size limitations because in order for your soldering to work you have to be able to heat the entire piece of metal up to the temperature where solder will flow. Well since metal conducts heat all of the parts of the metal that aren't currently being heated are acting as what's called a heat sink and they're essentially stealing heat from 
where you're trying to heat. So if you get too big of a heat sink, you can't ever get your um, metal hot enough to solder your joint. So now I'm going to take my um, file and I'm just going to file down the rest of that metal so I get a nice clean edge. Um, be careful you're not get, you're not filing off all the pattern on your gallery wire, though I tend to be uh, not as good at that as I would like. You can help that a little bit by kind of angling your file down a bit. And I'm just going to keep hitting my um, camera with my arm if I keep it over there. So. so all I'm doing is just cleaning up cleaning up the edge here so that I don't have any overlapping metal. So I just have a, a really nice clean edge. <laughs> Dental implants. Well, I mean, I guess one could. If if one were so inclined, I could I could make you a girl. Um, <laughs> though the general policy on the beading dream stream is always don't, don't eat, eat the, the beads. beads. Don't eat the crafting, just generally. Though I suppose one doesn't actually eat dental implants. That's true. Also, I have to say that Avenging Pineapple is an awesome handle. Completely. Um, so, I guess technically, even if we were, you know, making dental implants, they wouldn't technically be for eating. So, generally, whenever anybody hears this sound the filing they were like they don't want it to go any no nowhere near my teeth keep that away from me okay so now I've cleaned this up and it's looking very nice I mean it's looking dirty and stuff because I haven't pickled it but um, the edges are looking nice and I'm gonna take my 320 grit sandpaper and I'm just gonna hit this bottom edge here it's not really sharp but it's just a little sharp and that's gonna be just kind of hanging out there on the ring, so I want to make sure that it's um, comfortable to wear. So that's just 320 grit sandpaper. I like the wet dry stuff, but you don't have to. You can get the just the regular. All right, so there we go. So now I'm going to solder on my band that I made, wherever the actual heck I put it. Ah, there it is. Okay, so now the last soldering. Oh Lord, Amy, really? That Ooh. sucks. Um, I'm gonna take my band and just this, um, I'm gonna solder it on the joint, that way my joint will be hidden. But what I wanna do is I just wanna take my file and I wanna flatten the top of that just a bit. It's just gonna make it easier because that way I'm soldering flat to flat instead of round to flat. So you don't have to do a lot, but see, I just flattened out the top of that right there. Okay, so now I'm going to grab this again, and I'm going to take my setting, and I'm going to sweat some extra easy solder onto the back of it. Okay, so sweating solder means that I'm going to flux my piece, I'm going to drop some solder on there, and then I'm going to heat that solder until it melts. And then I'm going to take my torch off of the solder. So I'm basically melting solder onto the back of my setting. So I'm going to set that in the middle there. And I'm just going to heat until the solder flows. And you got a pretty big, pretty big chunk of metal here, so it's going to take a minute. All right, there we go. So that's sweating our solder. Now I'm going to grab my band and I could set this up in a third hand if I wanted to but I think I'm just gonna go and this is probably a, this is almost always a mistake when I do it but I'm just gonna hold that in a tweezers so that it's touching my solder and what I want is I want to heat this until my solder reflows and joins my two pieces together which I realized there that's a slightly better angle for y'all so what I'm looking for is right there at the joint I'm just looking to see that solder flow and I'm looking there we go. See it join those two pieces together. All right, which it did. So now I've officially soldered 
my band to my ring. So now this whole nasty, dirty thing is going to go into the pickle pod. And it's the time in the stream where I talk about pickle. What is pickle? What does it do? Pickle is a weak acid solution. And its job is to clean all of that junk, all of the flux residue, all of the oxide, all of the everything gross off of your piece so that you can do one of two things. So you can continue working on it. Because um, like I said earlier, sterling silver is a very princessy metal. And so um, a lot of times when you are soldering, you'll get to the point where your solder literally will not flow because your metal is so dirty. So um, at that point, what you do is you pickle your metal so that all that crap gets cleaned off of it and then you can continue to solder on it. Um, and I don't pickle a lot. Like most jewelers, most proper jewelers, pickle, pickle way more than I do. Like the gal who taught me, who's an amazing jeweler, love her to death. She's super talented. Um, she's in Chicago. Um, she pickled so much, like pickle before you start, pickle after every joint. I do not have that kind of patience. Um, and what I have discovered through years of being an impatient fabricator is that you really can get away with a lot less as far as, I know, right? Dang it, I thought I was being stealthy with that one. Now I've managed to get, I've just managed to get CA glue all over everything. So um, there's going to be a little bit of fun time with me and a bottle of acetone when I get home. But yeah, um, so uh, what I found over years of being a lazy ass jeweler is that you really can um, get away with far less pickling than I was led to believe when I was taught how to solder. So now I'm going to pull that out of the pickle. And how long does it have to stay in the pickle? So it stays in the pickle until it's clean, meaning until all of the grime and the grunge and the black stuff and the gross stuff is gone from... Okay, Amy, I don't know if that was on perfect, but that's a fantastic... Um, I'm going to put that on a bracelet because I feel like it me. Um, so all of that black stuff is gone. There's a little bit still on the inside of my setting, but honestly, I have an opaque stone, so it doesn't really matter. So I'm just going to um, dry that off. Now, at this point, um, the finish that's on this ring is what's called pickle white. Okay, so pickle white is basically a layer, well, not basically, it is a layer of fine silver on the surface of your metal. Because what happens when we put our, meat, our piece into the pickle is... Um, the black stuff is the base metal component of the silver. That's the copper content that has oxidized. So the pickle cleans off all of the copper oxides and leaves us with a layer of pure silver on the surface of this, the ring. So that silver needs to be buffed in order to shine up. Now, there are a couple ways you can do this. If you have a tumbler or have access to a tumbler, that's the easiest way to do it. You're gonna throw this into a tumbler with some stainless steel shot, water, soap, let it tumble for a day or so, and it's gonna come out nice and shiny without you having to really do much of anything. Um, tumbling's my favorite way to polish things because it's very low effort. It takes um, not a whole lot of effort. All it takes is time. So as long as you've got time, tumbling's a great way to go. If you want to manually finish it, You've got two options. You can use a rotary tool or a flex shaft with a buffing wheel, and you're probably gonna have to go through a couple of buffing wheels to clean, clean it up and shine it up, but that definitely is a highly effective way to do it. Or you can do what we're gonna do on stream today, which is the you know kind of the lowest tech version of finishing this, and that is gonna be to use some fine steel wool. This is um, quadruple zero steel wool, and I'm just going to use the steel wool to buff the surface of my metal. So at this level of fineness, the steel wool is not going to scratch your metal. It's just going to shine it out. So it's going to give me a nice kind of satiny silver finish. If you want a really, really blingy, shiny silver finish, like you can kind of see the difference between, you know, these two rings. This ring was tumbled. This is what I get with my steel wool. So if you want a really blingy silver finish, you are going to have to um, resort to either the tumbler or a uh, rotary tool. But if you like the satin look, steel wool does a great job. Um, and once again, you know, minimal, minimal supplies, minimal tech, 
minimal investment. You know, you don't have to have a rotary tool to do this. I don't really need to worry much about the inside of the setting since my stone's opaque. I do need to worry about these guys. So we're just gonna buff them. And of course the gallery wire likes to catch the steel wool, which is super awesome, except for the fact that it's not. And nobody likes steel wool dust, yuck. Okay, so that's my finished setting. So I've got, um, I didn't melt any points. I'm very proud of that fact. I have my band, my band is, and we are gonna give it a good test. Should have done that before I polished it, but that's securely soldered on to my setting. It's slightly off center, but we're just gonna ride right on past that. And I'm gonna clean that steel wool dump out of the setting. Not really gonna hurt my stone to have it in there, but might as well clean it out. <laughs> Noted, Amy, if, if this ring comes up missing, we will not um, check your hands that are clasped behind your back. Okay, so now I'm gonna put my stone into this setting and it's a tight fit, so I'm gonna have to smash it in there pretty good. Once again, Labradorite, very durable stone. Okay, I've been on this stream able to manhandle this stone way more than a lot of other stones out there. So when you're doing crap like I just did, make sure you know the durability of your stone and also remember that no matter how durable your stone is, you can still crack it. If you hit it the wrong way, if you hit it on a cleavage plane, if you press it the wrong way, um, you can absolutely bust a piece of that stone off or you know bust a crack right through the middle of it. Like you, you really, even with your durable stones, you have to be careful. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my chain nose pliers. The good thing about this being such a tight fit is I don't need to worry at all about it sliding off center. So I don't need to worry about working in opposition when I'm setting it. It does have a big old fingerprint on it. So I'm gonna just clean that off um, before I set it just because I'm afraid some of it's gonna wind up underneath the prongs. So it's just a little rubbing alcohol to get my sticky fingerprints off of there. Um, and then I'm just gonna take, I could do this with a prong pusher. I'm gonna do it with my chain nose pliers. Um, it's so easy though. You're just gonna grab each little bit and just bend it over just so it's laying against the stone. It really is that simple. So if this stone was a little looser in the setting, what I would do is I would do four or five down here and then I would go opposite and I do four or five up there and then I would do the same on the sides. Once again, this stone is so jammed into this setting, it's not going anywhere. It would probably never come out even if I didn't push the prongs down. So I don't need to worry so much about it, you know, potentially being off center. So I can just kind of go, go in order one at a time, getting these guys. So this is what I mean by it's much easier on the corners with the gallery wire because they'll just kind of, you know, nestle in there together. You don't have to worry about the weird kind of folding and cutting you sometimes have to do with regular bezel strip. Like this just sort of, just sort of does its own thing in a good way. Sometimes when things do their own thing, it's a bad way. This is a good way. And you do want to make sure that your prongs are all pressed as far down onto your stone as you can get because they can catch on things. And if they get, you know, bent up and then bent back down too much, they're gonna snap off, okay? So you want to make sure that they're really nice and pressed down against your ring, which is why I brought this over here because I can't do that at that angle apparently. And you may have to go around several times, and that's totally okay. Um, you know, the important thing is that the job gets done, not necessarily how long it takes. And really, don't forget to really get the very tips of them. Because um, it's pretty common to see, you know, you just, if you don't get all the way to the tip, you just have these weird little gaps between the prongs and the stone, and those are 100% places where it's going to catch and your prongs are gonna pull up. Okay, and once all of your prongs are down to your satisfaction, your ring is done. I did it, I didn't melt it, very happy with that. Once again, I did not mark it as sterling silver. I'm trying to get better at that, I am failing. But you know, live and learn, continue to continue. Keep on keeping on and all of that stuff. Amy did make a badass pair of Pico earrings today. She used a gorgeous strand of spinel and they turned out absolutely lovely. All right, so that is it 
for the Beating Dreams Torch Thursday tutorial stream. We did it. We made a ring. We made our gallery wire ring. Very excited. So we started with um, nothing but sheet metal, gallery wire, our half round wire, and our stone, and we fabricated it into this awesome thing. So uh, very happy with how that turned out. Thank you, Aso. I'm happy. And I'm also happy that it's not melted. <laughs> All right, so that is it for me tonight. For anybody out there who doesn't know me, I am, uh, it's a size seven, Amy. I'm Allison from Beating Dreams in Dallas, Texas. We are an actual brick and mortar retail bead store. We are here on Lover's Lane in Dallas. We have physical premises and we are open. Thanks, Jan. That is, uh, I think, also a size seven. That's my prototype. And it is also here at The Beating Dreams. Thanks, Linda. So yeah, if you're local in Dallas, we are open here on Lover's Lane to feed your need to bead six days a week. We're here Monday through Saturday from one to six. If you're not local in Dallas, you can find us on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beating dream five times a week with complimentary tutorial streams. So um, we stream, I'm trying to unplug the pickle pot subtly it's really not working <laughs> um anyway you can find us on this channel twitch.tv forward slash beating dream five times a week with complimentary tutorials that's going to be monday through saturday no 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 wrong wednesday through saturday at 6 p.m central time plus thursdays at noon and we do live merchandise sales every wednesday and every saturday at 7 30 p.m so that's going to do it for the torch through thursday stream this evening now Tomorrow night, however, you will not find us on Facebook, you will not find us on Twitch, you will find us tomorrow evening on Zoom for our Zoom Crafty Cocktail Hour. Thank you, Amy. So, if you want to hang out with some crazy folks, online, craft, drink, have some fun, um, we are here for you. If you have Zoomed with us before, you can use the same credentials as usual. It's the same recurring meeting. Um, we also did send out the email to all our typical recipients. If you're new on the stream, I know there's still a couple of raiders hanging out and you want to zoom with us tomorrow night just email beatingdreamsdallas at gmail.com and we will get you that zoom information all right so once again beatingdreamsdallas at gmail.com zoom crafty cocktail hour kicks off tomorrow at 6 p.m central time and goes until 8 p.m central time and is usually a barrel of wafts so that's it for me on the beating dream stream tonight everyone have a beautiful thursday night and have a great friday and Heather, thank you, just posted up in the chat our email address. You can also whisper or private message her um, or myself, though she's better because I'm really crap at check checking whispers for beating dreams. So that's it for us tonight. Hopefully everyone has a fantastic day tomorrow, a fantastic night tonight, and I'll see everyone on Zoom tomorrow at 6 p.m. Everyone take care, and we'll see you soon.